I got a date here, on November 13th, 1789. November 13th, 1789, Benjamin Franklin. So BJ, Benjamin Franklin wrote a letter to Jean-Baptiste Leroy. I'm guessing he's French or something. And Jean-Baptiste Leroy, and it contains what would become a famous phrase. So Benjamin Franklin writes, Our new constitution is now established and has an appearance that promises permanency. That's an interesting phrase. An appearance that promises permanency. But in this world, nothing can, said to be, can be said to be certain except death and taxes. Death and taxes. Exactly. <laughs> but in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. That was Benjamin Franklin. So Benjamin Franklin affirms a fact that drew me to the series that we're going to enter into this morning, that in this life, even though that there are things that have an appearance that promise permanency, quite often those things are not permanent. And the reality is, is that change and transition are inevitable. Change and transition are inevitable. So today we enter into a six-week series that I'm calling In Transition, Following God Through Times of Change. Following God Through Times of Change. A timely word, I think. Um, especially because uh, so many of us have not been able to enter into rhythms that just a few months ago we thought were normal, right? Rhythms in our families, Rhythms in our workplaces, rhythms at school uh, for your kids, as, as some of you have gone back to the school place, or maybe not, maybe you were in school and now you're home. Um, rhythms in businesses, even in our recreation, rhythms even in our churches. And all of this because of what we know as the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, now I am a believer in the God of the Bible. And the God of the Bible says of himself in Malachi 3.6, I, the Lord, do not change. Malachi 3.6, I, the Lord, do not change. The writer of Hebrews says of Jesus, God the Son, he says that, that this Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. I, the Lord, do not change. Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. So in this life, where I so often experience change, I, often, I also trust in what the theologians would call an immutable God, which means that He is an unchanging God in His character. This unchangeable God is also taught in Scripture as having an absolute sovereign dominion over all that is seen and unseen, and even, we might say, somewhat mysteriously, he has this absolute sovereign dominion within the context of allowing humanity to have a free will. So my point here is that this God that does not change, and this God that is supremely governing all things, is also the God in Scripture that is said to do new things. And he's also the God in Scripture that rarely allows our lives to remain the same for very long. So I wonder in this, why is this unchanging God so regularly prompting change? Before we entertain the why, let me reiterate the first and most basic point here Again, that our life and this journey of life and our walk with God, in this journey we should expect change. We should expect change, whether foreseen or, for, or unforeseen. This is actually true for all of people, right? Th this is the case for everyone. But as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we realize that there's really no such thing as chance. There's no such thing as coincidence. There's no such thing as happenstance. In all things that happen, whether for good, even for bad, because God 
His perfect will is even sovereign over our imperfect and broken wills. We see this hand of a providential God at work in all things, whether allowing or initiating events to ultimately to his perfect end. So during this series, I want to take a, a look at a few examples of God moving his people to and through transition. Because it's so a part of our lives. And say, so what can we learn as God moves his people through these stories? And today we're going to start with Abraham. So we're just going to, we're going to read a few sections of verses, starting first in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 7. We read in God's word, Genesis 12, 1. The Lord said to Abram, Abram, that name means exalted father. He says to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household. So there's extreme change going on here. Leave. Leave your country. Leave your people. Leave your father's household. And go to the land, to the land I will show you. Then he makes him this promise. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. We can be very, very grateful for that promise to Abraham. It says in verse 4, So Abram left this exalted father, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was, how old? 75. 75. <laughs> Abram was 75 years old when he went out of Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh in Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Alright, so we're going to pause there. We're going to go over, just turn a page to Genesis 17. And we'll read verses 1 through 8 as Abram's story continues. When Abram was how old? 99. 99. 99. Anyone do math here? No. 24 years later. Okay, it's basic math, I think. I think I did that right. Um, when he was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant, this is that covenant promise that he made with Abraham, between me and you, and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be a father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram, exalted father. Your name will be Abraham. So what's your cross-reference? Many of you have a cross-reference. It's a slight change. It's not exalted father. It's now what? Father of many nations. So God changes his name. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you. And kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. So now, if you put a bookmark, flip over to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 Verses 8 through 12. By faith, Abraham, this father of many, or the father of many nations, when called to go to a place he would later leave as his, uh, 
he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he what? Did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in a promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, as he, and he was as good as dead, remember that, this one man, and he was as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. And I tell you that the Bible teaches he's not just talking about physical Israel. Because the Bible says that if you believe in Jesus Christ, God's Messiah, you are children of the promise. So you too are descendants, spiritually speaking, of Abraham, one of those stars in the sky, one of those sand, grains of sand on the seashore. So, some people love change. Any of you here love change? Okay, so I said, so Christina, raise your hand. So, okay, so, so some people love change. They think about every transition as if it is a new adventure. But many, many people find the opposite to be true. Right? They're always trying to create life in such a way that it stays the same. So that life can be safely predictable, safely familiar. But again, if you've lived life long enough, you realize that God just doesn't allow that to stay that way very long. In many ways, it could be said that life is really a series of Changes, a series of transitions, some small, some major, some of our own choice, some that just seem totally out of our control. It could be a change in job, it could be a change in location, it could be a change in schedule, a change in opportunity, it might be a change in relationship, it might be a change in, it's your stage of life, you say, you say I just, I didn't expect things to be this way at this stage of life. It could be change in your health. It could be change in your sense of calling. It, it could be changes even in your understanding of life or even of God. It could be changes in your walk with the Lord. In, fi in fact, sometimes I think, it, it seems to me, I'm not real, real old, <laughs> um, but I'm older than I was 10 years ago, 20 years ago. It seems to me that I found that a lot of times, just when I feel like things are settled, just when I feel like, you know, I've, I've kind of uh, learned the ropes and, and gotten, you know, gotten a grip on things, gotten in a groove, something happens to force a change. I, I, was, I was invited up, this was actually now, I was invited, Cheryl and I were invited, I should say, in 2005 to a, a little church called Oregon Hill Grace Chapel. Uh, that we were invited 15 years ago. And I remember thinking, while, when we were invited, at first I was like, no way. <laughs> and what's interesting is a handful of years before that, I would have jumped at it. But at that point, I was like, no way. Uh, I actually said, to be nice, I'll think about it, I'll pray about it. Because that's what you say, right? I'll think about it, I'll pray about it. And, and, but in my heart, I was like, no. Because, so these things were rattling around in my head. We had a house, and we had just finished some projects on the house, and just got a few things like where we wanted them, you know, things that we had been planning and working on for so long. It's like we just got the house done. And, and in my work, I was running a small business at the time. I remember I was just at this point where I felt like I was finding a sense of peace and purpose in my work. And that was something that took several years to get there. 
And even in our church, we had struggled for a while. Should we be there? God, what do you have for us? And we had just gone to this place in this church that we were part of where we were like, we had this renewed passion and this renewed sense of mission. Like things were finally falling into place. And then, blammo! God's like, time to move. And the more I sought him, and the more Cheryl and I uh, talked about it, prayed about it, it was like so obvious that God was saying, yes, it's time to move. We had uh, Daniel Lee over for dinner the other night. And um, Daniel Lee was sharing with us, and I, I actually asked him if I could share this. You know, he's sharing with us, you know, he's been here, what, two and a half years, right, uh, uh, with the church. And he says, you know, I, I feel like I'm just, I've just started to figure out what it takes to minister here. <laughs> like, I'm just starting to figure out the rhythms and, and what God's calling to me, me to in this place. And just as he's starting to figure out, figure it out, God's like, time to spend a little time back home in South Korea. Time to start schooling with Gordon Conwell. Like, what, what is that about? But part of me says, should this really shock us? Should it really surprise us? Think about Abraham. So God not only changes his name. Imagine being 75 years old. Actually, I guess he was 99 at that point. Being 99 years old, and God's like, we got to work out a new identity here. <laughs> what? I've been living life for almost 100 years. No, but God's like, listen, Abram, I'm the master of your identity. And not only does he say, I'm the master of your identity, we're going to have a name change. He's like, you... You, he says, tells him at 75, you're going to have a total change in location. Which means, think about this, at 75 years old, Abram had to leave behind everything that was familiar. He had to leave his people, his land, everything that he knew, his home. He had to leave his, a lot of his extended family. He had to do so to the point that he went to a land of which he did not know. A place that, that, he, that we're told in Hebrews in which he felt a stranger in a foreign country. You ever come to places where you're just like, I'm a stranger here. And maybe that's a change in location. Maybe it's just a change in your life. Lord, I'm a stranger in this place. I thought I had it figured out. I, I thought I knew. I thought, I thought we had this plan. I thought things were settled. I thought I finally had a grip on things. And now I'm a stranger in this place. Yeah, but that's... That's the narrative of Scripture. Again, it really shouldn't shock us. God is always calling His people. When we read through the Bible, God is always calling His people to new places, to new things, uncomfortable circumstances, new and uncomfortable challenges, tasks, missions. We see it's in the life of Noah, in the life of Abraham, in the life of Joseph, in the life of Moses, Joshua, Daniel, the prophets... In the life of Jesus, you think he had to go through some change? I know you've been in glory forever. Now I'm going to send you into a life uh, that, uh, of a broken world, a life that you're going to put on flesh, that you're going to humanly lay down for the sins of the world. But don't worry, you will be raised to life three days later. I mean, Jesus, you think he went through some transition? <coughs> we see it in the life of the disciples. We see it in Paul. So as we understand this, I think we need to see that this is very much God's M.O. It's God's mode of operation. That not only should we not be surprised by change, we should expect it. But, as, but in this, I think we can ask, why does God so regularly call us to unknown places? And, and I think this is part of what we're going to be fleshing out over these coming weeks. But I think at least we can say we need to recognize that as much as we feel safety and all things remaining the same, there are hidden dangers in that place. There are hidden dangers in becoming too comfortable in the familiar. 
I, I thought of it like water. I just had a couple of quick slides. So there's this there's water that is ooh, I got my mic's on this side. Um, there's water that is life giving. And there's water that, that is healthy. But water like that does what? What? It flows. Healthy water, life-giving water, is moving water. Water that sits becomes what? Stagnant. And so, I, stagnant water, I read this online... Stagnant water is an incubator for many types of bacteria and parasites and mosquitoes and, you know, just all things that are unhealthy becoming hazardous for consumption and the environment. Healthy water, drinkable water, life-giving water moves. Stagnant water, water that sits, becomes dangerous. Unhealthy. Now, I'm not saying that you need to change jobs every year. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that you need to move to a different state every two years. In fact, there's a whole other conversation where we can talk about, um, you know, the, the fact that there's healthy rhythms in life, and even healthy routines in life, and healthy seasons in life, and, and God has created rhythms of, of seasons that are beautiful. Seasons of predictability and, and even how the rotation of the earth and how, the, how we see the sun come up and, and set every day. There's also something good about a stick to to learn to faithfully put roots down in one place over the long haul. Some people have struggled with that. And how important that is in the sense of relationships and community to really glean and gain and grow deep in relationships and community. But there's also something very unhealthy when within those rhythms we attempt to be so controlling over those rhythms and so controlling over our life that what we're really do, trying to do is say nothing can change. When we do this, I will suggest to you, you start living life mindlessly. And you start living life so mindlessly that you're lulled into thinking, I, I've, really, I've really got it all figured out. I, I, I'm controlling my life. Everything is the same. I know the rhythms. I've got it all figured out. But what's happening, actually, is you're becoming stagnant. And, and really, you stop being challenged. And you stop progressing in your thought and you stop progressing in your faith, you stop progressing in your walk with the Lord, and you start becoming unhealthy to yourself and to those around you. So I will suggest to you, into this tendency, into this tendency to, to when we're left to our own inclinations to want to find safety in all things the same, into this tendency, God is faithful to prompt change in your life. Sometimes when you don't like it. Sometimes when it's really difficult. Because otherwise we too easily become stagnant waters that promotes unhealth rather than that which is life-giving. Stagnant thought, stagnant faith, stagnant religion, stagnant practices. God is faithful to bring change. Um... Some Christians do this thing in the beginning of each year, maybe some of you do this, um, where they ask God to give them a word in the beginning of the year. Lord, give me a word, something that will kind of give me some insight for the year to come, set the pace, what, what have you. And, and I admittedly have kind of thought this um, at times a bit corny. No judgment. <laughs> so, but... At the same time, there's some things that I've thought, eh, I'm not sure, and is that corny? And At the same time, I'm like, Lord, I'm open to it. This thing that in my own mind say, is that, you know, is there validity to that? I'm open to it. So I've even prayed before, Lord, if you would give me some word, some insight, looking ahead, give it to me. I'm willing. So this year, <laughs> sure enough, um, and others can attest to this, that I've shared this in the beginning of the year, 
I felt like the Lord was putting on my heart this word, adjust. Adjust. And, uh, you know, that this year would be a year of change. And in that change, I would need to seek His face and be willing to adjust to those coming changes. So what was corny to me, to begin with, now I say, okay, Lord, I actually feel like you're putting something on my heart here. And, and I, I reasoned, you know, that God was surely leading us as a church into a new season. And some of that change has been difficult. Some of it has been beautiful. Um, I reasoned that I'd need to be sensitive to our adjustments as we move out of places that we are really comfortable. And, not, and that doesn't mean just in location, right? Location, I think, is just maybe even a symbol of this, but, but also in, in who we're called to be as a church, what our unique identity would be as a church. But, you know, I look back and I say, man, I had no clue <laughs> in January how fitting this word adjust would be in 2020. And, and, I, and I just look back and I say, thank you, Lord, maybe for starting to prepare my heart a little bit. But the fact is, is that change forces us to adjust. It forces us to adjust. But I think there's a couple of ways you will adjust. As change comes, and like I said, change is inevitable for all of us, and transitions are inevitable for all of us, I think there's a couple of ways you'll posture yourself. You will adjust in a couple of ways. You might adjust in this way. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> And you're going to fight. And you're going to fight because you are going to fight to keep things the same. Because change is freaking you out. And I am going to do everything to control my little world. And I am going to keep things as much the same as I can. You'll defend it. You'll protect it. You'll try and control it. But this morning I want to invite you to a different option. I'll invite you to see that in the removing of the familiar, God is calling you to adjust in ways that invite you into a deeper faith. That invite you into a more profound faith. That invite you into a deeper dependency and intimacy with Him. I, I, would, I would say that another way to posture yourself, instead of this, is this. I surrender, Lord. I will embrace what you have brought to me. I will see it as a tool to break me from those stagnant places. Those places that I find I have entered into, even in my walk with you, that have become mindless and apathetic and unhealthy. And I will allow myself to be open in those places for you to continue to remake me. To remake my thinking, my everyday living, my walk with you. And in so doing, allow God to invite us to unknown places. Abraham had to go to a place that he had no idea where he was going. Unknown places that will find a deeper intimacy with him, that will see him build his kingdom in and through us in new and unexpected ways, if we are willing. I just want to take a couple of final cues from Abraham. Uh, again, we can note that Abraham's call to the unknown was coupled with a promise. God promises old man Abraham, remember his name was changed, exalted father to father of many. He promises old man Abraham that out of him and his barren, childless, old lady wife, God would make a great nation of whom all peoples on earth would be blessed. And we see this fulfilled, this promise fulfilled in the birth of Isaac, in the eventual forming of Israel, and the eventual coming of Jesus Messiah. 
But to see this promise fulfilled, Abraham, Abraham had to move in, albeit imperfect, if you've read the story, he had to move in faith, a new profound faith that was willing to adjust to entering into the unknown, a willingness to embrace a host of changes, even at a really old age, which means many people would be incredibly stuck in their ways, things have to stay the same, I'm going to fight for them to stay the same, and and God tells Abraham, you need to go, okay, where am I going? Raymond Brown, and I'm going to do this really quickly, Raymond Brown, he's an author, a Bible scholar, writes that Abraham had to have five distinctive characteristics to his faith. Number one, he needed to have responsive faith. Obeying God's command, Brown writes, due to his unwavering confidence in a God who speaks, prepared to take God at his word because he knew it was a word of unrivaled authority, Decisive importance, immense power, and complete reliability. Abraham also had to have sacrificial faith. Having a willingness, Brown writes, to go out from all that was secure, prosperous, peaceful, and enjoyable. And and we can say, in a sense, Abraham had to empty his hands of the known. So that he had room to embrace the unknown. He had to have a courageous faith. Such a faith takes, Brown writes, a heroism and courage to take God at His word. Wow, I thought that was profound. I have to have a heroism and courage that takes God at His word. And then he writes, similar courage is expected of all who walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Abraham had to have a persistent faith. Right? He had to wait 25 years before Isaac is born. He and his son and his grandsons and his future descendants, the writer of Hebrews tells us, had to live in tents. He says that purposefully. Had to live in tents. There was this transient nature of him living in the land of promise. His faith persisted beyond his experience in the material world. Brown writes, Abraham possessed the land only by promise, not in fact. In other words, think about this. In other words, Abraham is promised, but he has to live in that promise as a reality. You get that? He has to live in the promise as a reality even though his circumstances don't tell him it's yet the reality. Does that sound familiar? Yes. It's, it's no different than we as Christians living in this broken world, marred by sin, where the Lord says, it is now that I'm building my kingdom in and through you, but there's also a kingdom to come. A promised kingdom, and it will come. But you're to live in the promise now as if it's the reality. Isn't that cool? It's the same thing that Abraham had to do. That that we, it's cool, we along with Abraham, look forward to this city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. So there's this, he's an architect, he's the one that draws it and plans it and all these pieces and then puts it all together, but he's also the builder that brings it to fruition. And Abraham also had to have a dependent faith. Abraham and Sarah trusted in a God who could do the impossible. I thank you, um, Roxanne, for that plaque because that little plaque that just in my keep my office that just says "expect a miracle" has been needed in my life many many times. Brown writes, relying on God, they proved his dependability to a man as good as dead. The child of promise was given. To a man as good as dead, the child of promise was given. Donald Guthrie writes, teeming life was to come from apparent death. Again, that should resonate forward. Teeming life 
from this man that was as good as dead, this woman that was barren and as good as dead, teeming life, your descendants will be like the stars and the sand of the seashore, will come from apparent death. Jesus hanging on a cross, teeming life, will come from apparent death as he raises from the dead three days later and raises everyone up who come to him in repentance and faith. So when God calls us to change and transition, it's a faith that is, that we're called to a faith that is responsive and sacrificial and courageous and persistent and dependent on the God who calls. And I believe in this, what we see is that God has bigger plans for us than we would have for ourselves. Right? God has bigger plans for you than you would have for yourself as you say, I just want everything to stay the same. Now when I say bigger, I don't mean that the way the world means it. More prosperous, more popular, more powerful, more comfortable. In fact, bigger with God in this broken world actually might be the opposite of those things. But from an eternal, heavenly standpoint, God is building in and through us those things that really matter, those things that will last for eternity. So as we close this introductory message on following God through times of change, remember this. I know that a lot of change is going on in your life. And as God calls you, even this week, into the unknown... Know this, that unknown is not unknown to Him. And as God calls you to places that you've never been, remember that those are places in which He is already present. And we know these things because as we began, even though life is full of changes, Changes that God allows, changes that God initiates in His perfect sovereign will. We still trust within those transitions the immutable, unchangeable God. The God that is infinite, the God that is sovereign, the God that is all powerful and all knowing, the God that is all present. The God who is, praise God, all loving and ever faithful. Amen? Amen. Father God, we thank you that you are faithful to your promises. We thank you that we can live in the reality of the promise, even though the consummation is yet to come. Lord, this has been a season of great change for the world, for our country, for us personally, for us as a church, for us as individuals. And we, Lord God, are learning even this morning that we can posture ourselves with our fists up or with our arms open. For Father God, we just pray that we can embrace change as a tool in which you change us. In which you draw us deeper into a faith that is truly, profoundly growing in you. And that we would seek your face in new and beautiful ways. That we would be flowing water and not stagnant water, we pray. We pray these, all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.